Hello, everyone. It is Phil Lee uh, returning with Civil War Chat. Today is uh, October 13th. It is a Thursday of 2022. Click on the subscribe button down here in the lower right to get future episodes. And also, if you click on the notification bell in the upper right, your kids are going to get the best Halloween candy to, that they can possibly get. You got to click that a notification button though to be notified when future episodes are released and to ensure that your kids get the best Halloween candy that anybody in the neighborhood could get. Okay, today is my topic is the secret court martial of Robert E. Lee. Well, let's go ahead and get started. As Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin documents, novels can have a bigger impact on history than even the most authoritative nonfiction analysis. Consider also the impact of Winston Groom's Forrest Gump on our national memory of the Vietnam War era. In this context, I wish to bring to your attention the secret trial of Robert E. Lee by historian Thomas Fleming. Fleming uses his 2006 fictional courtroom drama to formulate arguments for his 2013 disease in the public mind, nonfiction analysis identifying the causes of the Civil War. In other words, seven years before his disease of the public mind, the nonfiction analysis identifying the cause of the Civil War. He sort of brings all the features to the surface in his fictional account, The Secret Trial of Robert E. Lee. The novel is set in early June 1865, when Robert E. Lee is secretly tried for treason by a military commission prompted by Assistant War Secretary and former editor of the New York Tribune, Charles Dana. Lincoln is dead. Andrew Johnson is in the early stages of shaping his presidency, while radical Republicans use the trial as one way to work behind the scenes to gain control of the federal government. As a leading radical, Dana insists upon a military tribunal for two reasons, and Dana was a real person. First, if Lee is tried as a civil, in a civilian court, it would have to be in Virginia, where a jury would likely acquit him. Second, a military commission provides the prosecution an important advantage. For example, the judge advocate, who is the prosecutor in a military tribunal, is empowered to rule upon the admissibility of evidence instead of using an independent judge to rule on that admissibility. Now, although Ulysses Grant objects to the trial for violating his appomatic surrender terms, Dana silences Grant. Specifically, Dana threatens to rec recant his earlier field reports when he was a reporter for the New York Tribune that protected Grant uh, when Dana falsely denied and covered up for Grant's episodic drunkenness during the war. The five officer tribunal is composed of one fictional character and uh, four real generals, generals O.O. O. Howard, Ambrose Burnside, George Meade, and William Baldy Smith. Now the judge advocate general is Joseph Holt, who is assisted by General Ben Beast Butler. Holt had earlier prosecuted Lincoln's assassins, and Butler was the military commander in New Orleans, the first occupation commander for the, when the uh, Union Army had captured New Orleans, who, was, uh, who profited widely from uh, corruption and uh, trading with the enemy when he was in charge in New Orleans. Now, the specification against Lee are the following. One, betraying his allegiance oath. Two, prolonging an unwinnable war after Gettysburg. Three, causing the Andersonville deaths. 
for conspiring to assassinate Lincoln. Five, unlawful execution of prisoners. And six, his immoral defense of slavery. Lee is defended by Senator Reverdy Johnson, who was counsel for the white defendant in the 1857 Dred Scott case. Now, historian Fleming expertly presents the prosecution and defense cases of Butler and Johnson. That would be Beast Butler for the prosecution and Reverdy Johnson for the defense. After questioning a parade of witnesses that include Ulysses Grant, Horace Greeley, Charles Dana, Pete Longstreet, jo John Mosby, Jefferson Davis, Lewis Powell, Robert E. Lee, Henry Wurz, Edmund Ruffian, Charles Taylor, Wingfield Scott, Julia Tyler, and Mary Anna Custis Lee, among others. It seems likely, after all of this, it seems likely that Lee will be acquitted of all charges except defending slavery. After four years of the worst casualties in American history, Ben Butler's argument that slavery was a crime against humanity that merits convictions gains purchase with the judges. After Mary Lee, uh, Robert E. Lee's wife testified, that Southern women were genuinely fearful of, of slave rebellions, however, the judges begin to see the merit in her argument that growing Northern fanaticism made such uprisings more likely. Reverdy Johnson explains that Blacks outnumbered whites five to one in parts of the South, which places in Mississippi and South Carolina and Louisiana, for example. If, a, if America's black population was not permitted to naturally diffuse to other parts of the country, even as free men, they will become increasingly concentrated in the South, thereby intensifying the region's worries over a race war. In a private conversation, Dana explains to a fictional character, character that even though Northerners want to end slavery, they do not want slaves to leave the South and migrate to their own states. In actual history, Adjutant General Lorenzo Thomas conceded the point when he was sent South by Lincoln during the war to recruit Black soldiers. Even though the families of ex-slaves desperately needed subsistence, he informed Lincoln that the Northern states would not accept them as refugees. Only a couple of months before the war started, former President John Tyler of Virginia explained that John Brown's 1859 attempted slave insurrection amplified Southern worries. He had urged that Northerners at that time ease such concerns by investigating the six abolitionist leaders who secretly financed Brown. According to Fleming, during the secession crisis, Tyler requested that the New York Tribune, where, where Charles Dana was an editor and Horace Greeley was the owner, Tyler requested that the New York Tribune print an editorial asking for such an investigation of the sixth abolitionist who backed John Brown's raid in 1859. But Charles Dana turned him down. Additionally, Dana failed to tell Greeley of the request, even though the latter would have complied by printing such an editorial. Greeley, and Greeley was the owner, but Charles Dana kept the information away from him. Greeley's newspaper was America's most influential media in 1861. Charles Dana manipulated the news to advance his agenda even at the risk of a race war in the South. It's a lot like what's going on now in terms of an elite class of people manipulating the, uh, the media for their own purposes, regardless of the needs of the country at large. As a harmonger of his analysis seven years later in his book, A Disease in the Public Mind, 
several of Fleming's characters engage in an insightful conversation near the end of his Lee trial novel. Quote, we killed 600,000 men to free 4 million slaves and, not, and no one has a clue what to do with them or for them, well, said Stapleton. Except Dana and his fanatical friends, said Baldy Smith. Old Buchanan was right, said Stapleton. It was a disease of the public mind. Do you think the war was a mistake? A sham, I asked. I'll never call it that publicly, Stapleton said. The people could not bear it. It will take a hundred years before the people can face the truth. Try 200, said General Baldy Smith. And what they're getting at here is the fact that the North did not want Blacks to go migrate into their area. They wanted to keep the South as a reserve for Blacks. They wanted Blacks quarantined in the South. And for example, as late as 1910, half, excuse me, 90% of all Blacks remained in the South. In 1910, it was, was 50 years after the war started, no doubt. Um, and if you look at what happened from, from Texas, the admission of Texas as a state in 1845 to the present day, 22 states were admitted after Texas, and only two of them, when they were admitted, had more than 1% of their population as Blacks. And those two were West Virginia and Oklahoma, clearly border states of the South. What Baldy Smith is saying here is that it will take 200 years before the people that study the history will admit that it was a Northern objective to keep Blacks in the South that motivated their desire to keep slavery in, out of the Western territories. Fleming's novel pretends that the trial actually happened and for reasons explained in the story, was never entered into the recorded history. In that sense, it's a, his approach is much like that of Michael Crichton in the Adromina strain. Okay, I think you know, it's it's a it's a great novel. Uh, it it really it really illuminates major points about the Civil War that today's academic historians evade or ignore, but I think mostly evade. And one, one or the other. You can get them, you can get the true facts in Causes of the Civil War by Philip Lee. I think it's $22 at Amazon or Barnes and Noble. You can get it from me, autographed for $26. Just email me, Phil, P H I L underscore Lee, L E I G H at me, M E dot com. What this is going to do is it's going to cover a lot of things that was covered in this book, uh, the, the Secret Trial of Robert E. Lee, but it's also going to explain why the North chose to fight the war. The simple explanation is the war was all about the South wanting to protect slavery. But if the first seven cotton states were permitted to secede, there would have been no war. The North would not let them secede. And the reason they would not let them secede is that they saw economic ruination for their particular state with the, uh, with the advent of this union. There was no noble the, the the notion of preserving the Union was a noble gesture is false. The reason North wanted to preserve the Union is that they believed that the Union provided posterity, um, prosperity for all its members. And what they're from each individual state was concerned, they wanted the prosperity for their state. Therefore, they wanted to the Union to remain intact. Okay, that's our show for today. And I want to thank you for watching. We'll Look forward to seeing you next time.